as the other speakers have said, um, our collections hold a wealth of information that can be used to examine questions relating to climate change. Our long-term data sets can be used to extract pattern and test predictions. Examples of the sorts of studies that, ca that can be done include insights into extinction rates, shift in diets using isotope analyses, and we've had some researchers visit our collections to um, conduct these sorts of studies, and genetic studies to determine historical population sizes. So increasing temperatures are affecting mollusk distri distributions, as we've heard, with ranges of colder adapted species tending to shift southwards or for terrestrial mollusks altitudinally. So range shifts can be uh, based on historical known distribution ranges as determined from our collections. Often time series aren't necessary for this, uh, but point data records are enough to illustrate this. Um, as an example, um, Octopus tetricus, a species common in mainland Australia, has recently been found in northern Tasmanian waters. And this was first noticed by lobster fishermen when these octopuses started turning, into their, turning up in their pots and they weren't very happy about that. Um, this is likely to be due to increases in o ocean temperatures that are 3.8 times the global average of eastern Tasmania and further intensified by the um, increased movement of the East Australian current southwards, which is carrying warmer water plus octopus larvae. Um, so museum data has been used here to plot the occurrence of the species and reference to the collection dates can be used to determine range contractions as Don has described and, and as in this case range expansions. But in this talk, I'm going to focus a bit more on another trend that's already being observed as a result of climate change and that is shrinkage. Shrinkage is already being observed in a lot of organisms because development, growth and organism size are affected by temperature and water availability. To expand on this, this diagram shows a working hypothesis of the major processes of climate change effects on organism size and these direct effects and indirect effects occur as a result of increasing temperature and variable precipitation. Shelled mollusks have an additional problem. Because of ocean acidification, they're likely to become smaller at a given age or lose their ability to form shells. So what are the consequences of this? As we saw in the earlier slide, smaller bodies support smaller or fewer consumers. This could affect whole ecosystems because mollusks play a number of important ecosystem functions. We as humans need to be concerned about this because we, we as consumers will also be affected. About a billion people depend on fish as their protein source and um, it's predicted that fish size is going to decrease as a result of climate change. So that has some very serious implications. It's likely that the rate and the degree of shrinkage will vary widely among taxa. The study of museum specimens can be used to quantify changes in size across a broad array of taxa to examine the heterogeneity of size changes across taxonomic and ecological groups. Mollusks in our collection can also be used as a baseline to compare the effects of acidification on shell deposition in various taxa. This data can then be used for ecological mod modelling to try and reconstruct the mechanism, mechanism through which biota respond to changing climates. So why is this important? Well, being able to predict change is critical in creating strategies that reduce negative effects. The historical data held within our collections can play an important role in formulating these predictions. 
As a quick example, our collection has been utilised recently by University of Wollongong honours student Sharon Myers to examine, in this case, the possible evidence of human, human harvesting on intertidal gastropods. She looked at four species, the data of uh, two species are shown in this slide, and she took measurements of shell length, aperture length and shell width from representatives from our collection, together with me measurements she's made in the field. And the utility of this data can be seen by the significant correlation she found in size decrease over time. Three of the, the four species are known to be collected for human consumption. She picked the, the cutoff points as pre-1950 and post-1950 because those dates corresponded to an influx of immigrants after the war, largely from Europe, and um, these people were more likely to be utilising mollusks as a food source. Interestingly, the fourth species that she examined, Hinea brasiliana, is not normally eaten by humans, but it's still showing a decrease over time. So she's now trying to tease out from her data and further collection whether these results may be reflecting evidence of climate change uh, as distinct from humans harvesting or possibly both is happening. So to enable our collections to be useful, we need high quality data sets accessible for research. But as Pat has emphasized, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that quality data must be underpinned by reliable species identifications and determinations um, by experienced taxonomists. Otherwise, this data is of limited or no value. Um, and I'd just like to thank Sharon Myers, um, who isn't here today, for um, her permission to use her unpublished data for this talk. Thank you.